Dr. Julia Varshavsky uh, has her doctorate and your master's in public health uh, from the University of California, Berkeley. And your dissertation focused on developing methods for characterizing disparities in and evaluating dietary sources of cumulative phthalate exposures. Um, she is ser currently serving as a research scientist for the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, Cal EPA, conducting biomonitoring studies of health-related chemical exposures and recently accepted a tenure-track position as assistant professor of environmental health at Northeastern University starting this fall. Uh, Julia did a postdoc in mm -hmm. environmental epidemiology and biostatistics for the program on reproductive health and the environment at the University of California, San Francisco, where she conducted biologically based population level studies on exposure and health risks associated with endocrine disrupting chemicals, including uh, polybrominated diphenyl ethers, pair and polyfluorinated alkyl substances, and organophosphate flame retardants. So Julia, welcome, and we are all ears and the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. That was a very nice introduction. Um, and I will say just on a side note that I think I'm really excited to be here today. Um, and on a side note, I um, I think I was at one of the first Workplace Health Without Border um, meetings, maybe at the ISES conference years ago, but maybe I have that wrong. I've been a really passive participant uh, since then, which means I've I've been on the listserv and that's it. But um, but it's kind of nice to circle back and be able to sort of um, connect this work with um, this group. So I'm really happy to be here. And I uh, I am gonna be talking about uh, about five to 10 minutes about a pilot biomonitoring study on phthalates exposure uh, among Vietnamese American nail salon workers in California. And I just wanna make sure that you can see my slides without the notes. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes. <clears throat> okay, great. And um, uh, like, uh, like it was already said, my uh, current affiliation is with the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, or we had the Cal EPA, and I have my contact email here. Please feel free to reach out uh, with feedback or questions um, after this discussion. Uh, but I did want to just reiterate that the work that I'll be presenting today was conducted at the UC, at UC Berkeley, um, and that was in conjunction or in collaboration with the Cancer Prevention Institute of California. Um, and it was, uh, this was sort of a, a pilot study that I led as part of my dissertation research uh, under the guidance of Tu Quach, uh, the PI of the study at um, CPIC. And uh, it was in response uh, to needs, uh, data needs identified by key stakeholders for phthalates biomonitoring in nail salon workers. So the idea was to be responsive to um, some of the needs that had been identified. Um, so with that, um, I'll just go over a brief background on phthalates and nail salon workers in California, then talk about what we did in the study, uh, what we found, and why it's important. Um, so phthalates, uh, pronounced with a PH, uh, but spelled with a TH, or pronounced or spelled with a PH, but pronounced with a TH, excuse me, <laughs> are a family of 20 high production volume chemicals that have uh, garnered significant public attention in, in the last tw 10 to 20 years or so. And that's really because of their um, widespread exposure profiles. Um, so the, um, almost everybody has measurable levels of phthalates in their bodies, phthalate metabolites in their bodies. And the reason for that is because they're plasticizer chemicals that are used in a really wide range of consumer and personal care products. The primary exposure um, sources are thought to be food from food packaging or uh, food production, but also from personal care products like nail polish and fragrances. Um, they're used in a wide range of plastic materials like children's toys, medical equipment, uh, shower curtains, and anything really that's made with PVC or polyvinyl chloride material. And the reason why we care about the widespread exposure is because they've been, um, or they're biologically active endocrine disrupting chemicals, which means that at low levels, they can um, interfere with the molecular signaling that regulates human reproduction, uh, development, and function. 
And so they've been linked to a wide range of hormone-mediated health impacts across the life course, um, including infertility and pregnancy complications, uh, reproductive tract malformations, uh, neurodevelopmental problems, uh, asthma, cancer, and metabolic outcomes. Um, and they've, there's good evidence to suggest that they can even have additive effects on reproductive health and development. So that means that they can have greater effects in combination, which reflects our modern day exposure uh, to phthalate mixtures. And so the reason why we care about phthalates with respect to nail salon workers is because one, the nail care industry is a rapidly growing, I know COVID has, has had its own impact, but um, it's been rapidly growing in recent years. And that's especially true in California. Uh, we have the largest number of manicurists and salon, nail salons in the country. And uh, with over 100,000 registered nail technicians in the state, most of the workers are low income Vietnamese women um, who are of reproductive age, not all, but most. Um, and, um, and who typically have limited access to chemical safety and health information. Um, and who also use phthalate containing products on a daily basis. So uh, for example, mono N butyl phthalate MNBP is a known ingredient of many nail polishes and it's used to um, make the nail polish or uh, sort of impart flexibility um, and smoothness and prevent the nail polish from chipping. Um, so the hypothesis here is that this is a uniquely exposed and potentially vulnerable occupational cohort and the objective of the study then was to characterize exposure to certain phthalates in this occupational um, community. So to do the study, I teamed up, I, like I said, with the PI, and can you still hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Dr. Tu Quach and her colleagues at CPIC uh, to recruit 17 Vietnamese American nail salon workers at six Bay Area salons. And this was part of a larger intervention study um, on reducing chemical exposures in the workplace. So we collected post-shift urine samples for each worker uh, before the workers were trained on how to reduce their workplace exposure to chemicals in general. Um, so these were pre-intervention samples. And then we analyzed those urine samples for four phthalate metabolites. And we selected those based on ubiquity of exposure, but also um, predicted relevance for nail salon workers. The samples were analyzed at the Environmental Chemistry Lab at DTSC or the Department of Toxic Substances and Control, which is also part of Cal EPA in Berkeley, California, using uh, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. And I actually worked um, as part of my dissertation work um, in that lab with a staff chemist there to develop and adapt, to, uh, to adapt and validate the method that the CDC uses for phthalate metabolite uh, analysis, which is kind of considered the gold standard. Um, so then we compared our levels in, in nail salon workers to Asian Americans sampled in the US uh, general population by NHANES, the National Health and Nu Nutrition Examination Survey, which is the um, ongoing survey of the US population by the CDC. Um, and this, these were samples that were part of the 2011-12 NHANES survey cycle. And we did that comparison using uh, param both parametric and non-parametric t-tests uh, for the statistical analysis. So in our study population, all 17 of the nail salon workers were born in Vietnam and all uh, preferred to speak Vietnamese at home. The average age um, was about 40 years old. Most were women. There was a wide range of hours worked per week uh, with a mean of about 35 hours worked per week. And what we found were comparable or higher levels of uh, among our nail salon workers compared to Asian Americans in the NHANES population. And specifically, we found uh, almost three times higher MNBP, mono N butyl phthalate levels, um, uh, 1.5 times higher MIBP levels, and MEHP, uh, mono 2 ethyl hexyl phthalate, was about 2.6 times higher in nail technicians compared to Asian Americans in the NHANES population. And then MEP, mono ethyl phthalate, was um, uh, uh, slightly higher or elevated in our nail salon workers, but the difference was not statistically significant. And this is another way of looking at the exact same data where you can see again that phthalate levels were about 1.5 to three times higher in nail salon workers for three out of four metabolites. 
Oh, and it's also you. oh, it's also worth noting that some workers had much higher levels than in NHANES, with a few above the NHANES 95th percentile for each of the four metabolites, and one with levels above the NHANES 95th percentile for all four metabolites. We also looked at cumulative phthalates exposure by combining phthalates in a potency weighted sum, uh, since again, phthalates can have additive effects in combination. And we were able to show uh, that Vietnamese immigrant nail salon workers had twice the level of cumulative phthalates exposure as Asian Americans in the NHANES population that were again sampled around the same time period in 2011. So you can see in these box plots, the distribution of cumulative phthalates exposure um, expressed in micrograms per kilograms per day on the y-axis. And we're comparing the geometric means here, which are the dashed lines just above the medians. Um, and so you can see there's a pretty clear difference in the geometric means between these groups. And there's very little overlap between the boxes themselves, which indicates the distributions are indeed different. And that's you know, supported by this very small p-value of the difference between groups. Um, of the statistical tests of the dis difference between groups. And the solid red line here is the NHANES 75th percentile. So you can also see, again, that some of our nail salon workers had high cumulative phthalate levels that were above or well above the NHANES 75th percentile. So in conclusion, uh, we found about 1.5 to three times higher um, phthalate metabolite levels or two times higher cumulative phthalate levels among Vietnamese nail salon workers in California compared to Asian Americans in the general population. And we also found that some workers are exposed to high levels of multiple phthalates at the same time. And so while this is a small study, a pilot study, um, it does provide, I think, suggestive or supportive evidence that nail salon workers are disproportionately exposed to certain phthalates. Um, and I think that finding warrants further investigation, but I think these findings can, can, can inform ongoing and future efforts to ensure health and safety um, of nail salon workers. Um, and I know there are um, you know, various groups and efforts that are involved in different ways in doing that from, um, from protecting workers uh, in salons to uh, upstream uh, pushes for ingredient disclosures and safer alternatives. And I think we're gonna hear more about that today. So I will, um, I'll end there and just, um, uh, I, I've included a link to our study here, the citation here, um, but I just would like to end by thanking my co-authors on the study, in particular Tu Quach, who was the PI of the study, and Tuan, who invited me to present our findings here today, and I look forward to more discussion about this topic. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, Julia, that was wonderful, and we really appreciated all the work you've done and your willingness to share it with us. Um, I, I think maybe we should continue with the presentations unless someone has a pressing question. Um, and then we, David, it looks, yeah. Um, Julia, very, very nice talk. Uh, I had a very brief question. Um, the, um, you had 15 women and two men who were sampled, who worked in the uh, nail salon. Were you able to adjust in your comparisons with the um, the NHANES data, the sex differences, or or was that just yeah yeah yeah? So because it was only two men, what I did was I did do a female only comparison. So we did that, and and the results were very similar. So I just left them all together. But yeah, it's a good fine. That's absolutely fine. Good, yeah. good, all good. Thank you. That, that's great. So uh, Dr. Aurora Lee is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. And she is a certified public health and a certified safety professional. And she plans to sit for the CIH this spring. So I'm sure we all wish you lots of good luck and I'm sure you'll do great. <laughs> <laughs> but um, before um, joining the University of Michigan, she worked as an academic specialist at Indiana University School of Public Health in Bloomington, managing the biosafety and infectious disease training initiative, 
She also worked um, at the uh, University of Nebraska Medical Center and the Nebraska Biocontainment Unit. Uh, at the, uh, supporting their research and program activities after having treated three evacuated Ebola patients in uh, 2015 and 2016. Um, her interdisciplinary research in occupational safety and health and industrial hygiene focuses on occupational health disparities, infectious diseases, psychosocial factors of OH, OSH and the intersection between health behavior, OSH and IH. And for Dr. Marie Ann Rosenberg, uh, she's an assistant professor at the University of Michigan School of Nursing in the Systems, Populations and Leadership Department. And her program research focuses on addressing occupational health disparities among youth and adult working populations at risk for experiencing one or multiple chronic conditions. Uh, she is interested on in mitigating socio-ecological stressors and in remediating the associated pathophysiological and maladaptive behavioral responses and tertiary outcomes among vulnerable workers. Um, Dr. Rosenberg received her master's degree um, at, at where she focused on social determinants and the health of communities and populations. And she earned her <clears throat> doctoral degree with a, a specialty focus on occupational and environmental health as a fellow at the Center for Disease Control, National Institute, Occupational Safety and Health. And she completed her postdoctoral training funded by the NIH at the University of Michigan. So with those impressive accomplishments, um, the floor is all yours and we are all ears. Thank you so much, Mary, for this wonderful introduction. Good evening, everyone. It is an honor for me to join this call today and for my colleague, Aura, and I to share the work of the Michigan Healthy Nail Salon Cooperative, which I will refer to as MHNSC for the rest of this short presentation. Um, so for many of you on the call, what you are about to, um, what we're about to share is not new to you. However, we thought it would be a good idea to give a general overview for any new ears on the call today. Can you guys see my slides okay? Yes. Okay. So a quick background overview of Emmy Tennessee. Emmy Tennessee was formed in 2016 by Dr. Edward Zellers, who is on the call today, who was then the director of the industrial hygiene program at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. I joined the team in 2017, and I have been co-leading those efforts with Dr. Zellers since. And this past September of 2020, Dr. Zellers um, retired and passed the baton um, He's co-leadership baton to Dr. Lay, and I am excited to work with Dr. Lay as we'll see later in this presentation um, that in the short period of time of less than six months, Dr. Lay and I have made some positive strides with MHNSC and we hope to do more. So MHNSC is a multidisciplinary collaboration with individuals of diverse backgrounds and training comprising of not only university faculty members, but also of students and, and community members. Our goal is to serve as a resource for nail salon owners and workers on issues around workplace health and safety, provide continuing education and training, and build a community-based research practices. This is our working framework, which does a pretty good job, I think, at showing our three focal points of education, advocacy, and research. This figure here really shows you our inputs, our outputs and associated outcomes. So up here, for example, for advocacy, um, you will see that we have um, done our best to uh, connect with local nail salons in the Ann Arbor and FC area so far only. Um, we have done so in person, via flyers, we've made phone calls and also social media. We have held meetings with nail salon owners and workers, although not as, as frequent as we would have liked. But we are working um, on that as one of our primary focus um, area. 
And um, one of our goal, of course, is to establish a stronger partnership with local nail salons in the community. In terms of advocacy, also we have developed and distributed flyers with information that the workers indicated a need for. We have flyers focusing on um, various exposure topics such as chemical exposures, bloodborne pathogens, hepatitis C, and fungus. One of our goals for advocacy is that the workers and owners can reach out to us and look up to us for any information about their rights, um, about training, and any other information that can be helpful for them to remain sustainable within the community. In terms of education here, you see that we have focused on two primary outputs, not only focusing on training um, the workers themselves, but also students who are interested in occupational health and safety programs, such as those in industrial hygiene and occupational health nursing programs. We hold seminars where students learn about the exposures and health concerns of the nail salon workers in general, not only in Michigan. And we also, con um, the students also contribute to our community focus endeavors, such as doing walkthrough assessments, contributing to development of the brochures that I mentioned. In terms of research, which is over here, we have conducted focus groups with now salons. And one of our collaborators and partners, uh, Dr. Stuart Badman and his colleagues actually conducted, I believe the first study from Michigan that looked at exposures among now salon workers in the community. Um, we also are in the process of doing other um, research-based projects such as co um, scoping reviews of existing interventions among nail salons. We're developing a paper on looking at the state of the nail salons in the state of Michigan. And we, um, we will be happy to share later on a research project that we just found out that we got funded for this, this week. This is um, some example screenshots of our brochures that we developed. And um, I will say that we really are encouraged by the students' effort to collaborate because the students in the language um, department who were taking Vietnamese, um, the Vietnamese course, they one of their key um, contribution was to actually help translate those flyers from English to um, Vietnamese. So one of our key outputs that I mentioned in our figure is the development of a training module for Nail Salon. And we are so proud of this module, although it has a lot more work to be done for it to be um, a, fin a fine product is that this is the first one of its kind because if you look through the literature and even on the OSHA website, you'll see published PDF files, right? But nothing in terms of an interactive video format that the workers could sit and, and, and listen. Because of course we developed the brochures, but we do understand from our focus group interviews that the workers would prefer some type of interactive thing that they can go in, listen to, go back in whenever they want instead of having to sit and read something. So these are some screenshots of the um, the content and actually just as a um, activity, let's, let's think about this here. This is one of the interactive questions that we ask the workers as they're completing the training. You start your shift um, a, um, a little late and as you walk in, you see a coworker removing nail polish. The front and only door remains closed. No windows are open. No fans or, AC or air conditionings are on. And you notice a strong odor. What are some of the some ways that you can reduce the strong odor? What would you say the, answers, the answer is here? Anybody? All of the above? Yes. Yes. So these are some of the things that we have in terms of activity where we would ask the questions, provide the information and go back. So some of the questions are more intricate than others. Um, so at the end of the training, the individuals then would be able to print a certificate of completion. And the goal would be that it would be in a form of encouragement where the worker could print that and post it on their station or even somewhere within the nail salon. And um, Dr. Zellers, myself and the students worked, worked hard on, on, on this, including you know, the, 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 
the, the look of it. And uh, Dr. Lay um, and some students and myself, we actually also developed this flyer here, which we used to recruit uh, potential individuals through social media to go ahead and complete this certificate of completion and the training on chemicals exposure and safety. Just to highlight some of the scholarship um, that we have here, of course, um, Dr. Lee and I, we are assistant professors, we're early career faculty members, so we're really um, interested in really highlighting our outputs, our, our products based on what we've been doing. So um, I mentioned Dr. Batterman's um, publication. We actually um, published the focus group on um, perceived exposures and express intervention needs, which actually guided the development of the brochures and this training module that I mentioned. And this was a student that we let, um, we provided them the opportunity to learn how to write a manuscript, um, a student-led manuscript. And we um, also developed a manuscript that's under review because we, because we are so focused on interventions, right? And providing support for the workers, we wanted to really have a good idea of what's already out there. So not re we're not reinventing the wheel. And we unfortunately only were able to, found, to find four interventions that looked at, <laughs> um, aimed at promoting the health and safety of nail salon workers. And we worked with a librarian, um, a library informationist to, to help with that. And that's Shannon here, and that's currently under review. And Dr. Lee and I are currently, and I believe a student will be a co-author on that as well, um, forthcoming on really looking at the state of the nail salon of Michigan. And we're looking at citations and any other information that would be pertinent. And lastly, we would like to publish the development, the initial development of the online training module, which we actually plan on um, tapping back to Dr. Zellers once that's ready. Um, since he, he um, was there in the initial development for that. We have um, also presented our work at several um, venues. And in terms of grant application, the MLEAD was the funding source for the initial development of the online training module. And this is the grant that we just found that was funded on Monday. That's the Michigan Graham Sustainability Institute. And this funding is actually going to support the transitioning of the online training module into a more interactive app. Um, and Dr. Lee actually had a good connection with somebody who focuses on web development and um, application and apps. So that's what we're planning on doing. And we were in the process of developing an RO3 and um, that we were going to submit in June. But given the urgency of the GRAM, because that's only an eight month funding project, we are um, going to push that to submit in the fall. And I, um, I will say that the, um, the GRAM Sustainability Institute is actually being done in collaboration with some folks such as um, Tuan, who's on the call, and also Swati from the California Nail Salon Co Co Collaborative um, as consultant to help us make sure that we have a rigorous product. These are some of our short-term and long-term goals. This list is not meant to be exhaustive, right? Of course, one of our primary thing is to focusing on strengthening community connections, extend collaborations across states, and across cities in Michigan, as I mentioned so far, we've only been focusing on Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti. And recently we had a student really identify some, a large number of uh, nail salons in Grand Rapids and Lansing area. So we plan on reaching out to those as well. And um, our long-term objectives here become a resource, as I mentioned, engage with Myosha, which is one of our key objective as well, influence, um, working with the beauty certificate programs, um, the cosmetology schools, which is one of our goals in our grand sustainability um, fund as well. And long-term, long, long-term goal is to establish a health, healthy nail salon certificate program modeled after the California um, work. 
And this is our hopes, which with the Workplace Without Border group here, um, we really want to be an active member in presenting, learning the work that you guys are doing. Any funding source, because Aura and I, every time we meet, we have, we have grand ideas of how we could make things work. But as you guys know, nothing works without money. So when the time comes, we'll knock on your doors for some funding support. Any potential collaboration, as I mentioned, we really enjoyed, have enjoyed collaborating, connecting with Tuan. Anybody else who would like to work with us, we're happy to connect. And also getting some feedback on the work that we have done so far and in the future with Michigan. That's all I had. I'll stop talking and stop sharing. Well, that was Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, congratulations on your funding. That is really exciting news. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if anyone has any quick questions now or um, when we all re uh, reconvene as a panel after the next presenters. Okay. Well, then, um, I think we will move on and um, Mr. Tuan Nguyen is our next presenter. Uh, for some of us, he doesn't need an introduction, but uh, for everyone, he's, he's been, um, has over 30 years experience as an industrial hygiene consultant, um, providing services to business and in high hazard industries for the largest worker compensation insurance company in California. And Tuan has worked at uh, Air Pollution Effects uh, Laboratory at the University of California, Irvine, where he helped coordinate and conduct research in air pollution, inhalation, toxicology. He served as a team leader for the Nail Salon Health Hazards Evaluation Project at the State Compensation Insurance Fund. And um, he's made many presentations on workplace exposures at conferences in both the United States and Vietnam. He's currently a member of the steering committee on the National Scientific Advisory Committee of the California Healthy Nail Salon Collaborative. Tuan has organized and co-taught the Occupational Hygiene Training Association courses at the National Institute of Occupational and Environmental Health in both 2016 and 2018 in Hanoi, as well as Ho Chi Minh City. And he's currently a roster candidate of the Fulbright Specialist Program. He serves as the AIHA ambassador to Vietnam. And in 2016, he co-founded the Vietnamese Industrial Hygiene Association in Vietnam and currently serves as a member of the board of directors. He's also a member of um, uh, Association Director of the International Occupational Health Association. And he is our beloved Vice President of Workplace Health Without Borders in the US branch. So welcome, Tuan. <laughs> Thank you, Mary, for the introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Mary said, uh, I involved with the California Healthy Nail Salon uh, for more than 10 years. Uh, one of the reasons I'm very familiar with it industry because when I was younger, I used to hang out in my uh, mother nail salon, uh, her beauty shop also including hair, uh, to watch all the uh, nail technician doing their beautiful work on uh, the customer hand. And, uh, you know, we don't think this these places at a uh, potential hazardous work environment. But in reality, the manicurist constantly exposed to uh, toxic chemical and they experience headaches, dizziness, uh, rashes and other acute symptoms. And as Julia mentioned earlier, uh, some chemical are known to cause uh, illnesses such as cancer, reproductive developmental hazard, and as well as uh, respiratory hazard as well. Okay, so uh, this is one of the study that we did. Uh, in 2010, and I, I and with other co-workers at State Fund, we conducted this study. Uh, the study include about 15 nail salons, uh, 
uh, we measure the airborne exposure level of chemicals used in the products. And uh, here are some of the equipment that we use to monitor for the contaminants. For uh, organic solvent vapor, we use suma canister, 3M OVM, aldehyde batches, and pumped with a 10x tube for dibutyl phthalate. For dust, we use the TSI side pack dust monitor with the impactor and the cut off side 2.5 micron. And we also use the uh, IAQ count to uh, monitor for temperatures, carbon dioxide, and humidity level. Uh, this is the data from the study. As you can see, all the level are below the OSHA permissible exposure limit. And the unit is expressed in milligram per cubic meter of air. Uh, if, you, if you look, all the level are very low, including the 15 minutes uh, short-term exposure limit. Uh, one thing I like, like to note is the uh, methyl metacalate, which is MMA or the threshold, is about 0 0.3 milligram per cubic meter. So that is why when you're in the new, the new salon, you can smell the methyl metacalate odor because at, you see here on the data, the level are between 0 0.1 up to 0 0.055. And for the 15 minutes, it went up to over uh, one milligram per cubic meter of air. So all the level are low. Uh, they are below the PEL and STEL. But however, this is a mixture. So we also uh, monitor for TVOC, which stands for total volatile organic compound. And we uh, normalize it to tar you in. And for the eight hour indoor exposure, we found a range of 5.4 to 9.2 milligram per cubic meter of air. And for the short term, 15 minutes, it go up to about 31 milligram per cubic meter of air. So looking at this level, you can see that uh, uh, the 3.0 to 25 milligram per cubic meter of air can cause discomfort, headache. Uh, if above that level, it is considered a toxic range where other neurotoxic effects might occur. And this, is, this table came from a study published in 1991 by uh, Mojave uh, regarding a volatile organic compound in an indoor air quality and health journal. Uh, this is a typical nail salon workstation setup. You can see a cheap uh, desktop uh, air filter with a fan. The purpose is one blow and one suck <laughs> uh, the air away from the customer or the worker. But if you look at the desktop air cleaner, the filtration material is so thin and it was not installed properly. So the air and the contaminant can go, can bypass the filter by going through the gap. So the people that sit behind these uh, equipment will, sub will be subjected to all that exposure. Okay. And here's another uh, layout. Uh, you can see the picture on top. This is the uh, one that was in the uh, NIOS publication. It is a downdraft system where all the dust particles go down to uh, the grill on top of the counter or, or the workstation and it got cooled down by the vacuum pump and exhaust to the outdoor. And this is one of the setup in one of the new salon. Uh, you can see that the fan were coated with dust, heavily coated. And because it lack of maintenance and also it not designed properly in the box, in the workstation, they are missing a filtration bag to capture the dust. So basically the fan will suck all the dust, blow it into this box, deposit into the uh, chamber 
and then drop down to the uh, hole at the bottom. So, so looking at that, you realize that these people need a lot of help, not only in the maintenance procedures and uh, using the correct exhaust ventilation system. We also saw all the uh, potential hazards such as back injury from bending, uh, repetitive motion, uh, trip and fall hazard from carrying bucket of water uh, to and from the foot spa. Uh, during that time that we did the study, the nail technician had began to use the plastic liners for the foot spa to minimize or reduce the cleaning time between customers. So uh, we know they need help. So in 2005, uh, California Health in Nail Salon were established. And California Health in Nail Salon addressed the health, environmental, reproductive justice, and other social issues faced by low-income female, immigrant, and refugee workforce. Uh, we employ a multi-pronged approach that combine community organizing, policy advocacy, and community-based research. And our aim is to develop solutions that benefit the nail salon workforce, small immigrant and refugee-owned businesses, their family, and their community. Our vision is to transform the nail salon industry from a low-wage, toxic industry to one that is safe and healthy for all, and that recognizes the right and dignity of all the workers. Uh, we also support research, outreach, and base building strategy with organizations across the country and also in the Vietnamese community. Uh, regarding advocacy and policy, we have sponsored and co-sponsored uh, several bills and uh, all of the have passed, uh, such as the AB 647, it required the manufacturer to post SDS uh, or safety data sheet regarding their cosmetics and disinfectant on their website. And the SDS must be translated into different languages like Spanish, Vietnamese, Chinese, and Korean. And uh, we also help pass the AB 2775, which required the ingredient to be listed on professional cosmetic products. Uh, also, uh, in uh, 2016, uh, we have passed the bill AB 2125 that call for the state support of local healthy nail salon recognition program. And I will talk more about that later. And here are some uh, others bill that will pass. Okay. The California Healthy Nail Salon Recognition Program was launched in 2010 and to help establish the Healthy Nail Salon Recognition Program throughout the state of California. Uh, it designed uh, to have nine components, which if the nail salon uh, belong to the program, uh, they need to follow some of these guidelines. Uh, for example, uh, not to use uh, Toxic trio, uh, dibutophthalate, toluene, uh, formaldehyde, and use safe nail polish remover that don't have ethyl or butyl acetate. And if they use the nail thinner, uh, they need to avoid toluene or methyl ethyl ketone, and so on. And one of the key component is within one year of joining the program, they need to install a mechanical ventilation system and also they need to commit to adopting safer nail products. And right now the program has been established in the city of Santa Monica, Alameda, San Francisco, Santa Clara, and San Mateo County. Okay, so beside all that, we also do online training. And uh, recently we put on a series of seven module on COVID-19 they are available on the website and in uh, three different languages, English, Cambodian, and Vietnamese. So the nail salon worker or owner can get onto this uh, website, sign up, 
everything is free and they can start their training program. And at the end, after they finish the seven modules, they will receive this certificate, which I just finished last night. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, the module will break up into small chunks, like three or four minutes each. So it's very easy for people to go through and stop and then uh, restart again. Uh, during last year, the uh, COVID-19 uh, lockdown, uh, we also joined with the uh, UCLA. So basically, uh, one of the important highlight was 70% of the owner want to have clear guideline on safety and health not only for COVID-19, but uh, other issues related to uh, uh, occupational injury as well. Uh, this is a poster on an event that celebrate, celebrate the legacy of the uh, nail salon worker in the Vietnamese American nail salon worker. All this started out in 1975 where Back in 1975, uh, the, the picture of the actress is not here, but uh, I hope you're familiar with the actress named Tippi Hatron. Uh, she was a volunteer at the refugee camp called Hope Village outside Sacramento. Uh, she brought her uh, personal manicurist. Uh, this lady over here, her name is Kusti, no, uh, Dusty Kutz. Uh, on her Puta Butera, she has been married since then. Uh, this is to celebrate the legacy of the Vietnamese American uh, nail salon business in America. And uh, so she brought this lady to teach the first 20 Vietnamese manicures in the camp on how to do uh, nail. Uh, and the rest is history. Right now, the Vietnamese American dominate the nail salon businesses and they were able to uh, drop the price so low that uh, all the working class women and young people could afford this luxury. And uh, this was the, an event to celebrate that. And in the panel, the first person list uh, picture here is Tuan Le, she one of the original trendy manicurists. And uh, the person next to her is the instructor that taught the trendy manicurists. And uh, Van, Nguyen, Van Nguyen is the one of the uh, business owner, a nail salon owner. And then the next four people are the movie directors to put on various programs related to the Vietnamese nail salon. And uh, the person right here, Lisa Fu, she the CEO of the uh, California Healthy Nail uh, Collaborative Program. And uh, next to her, that's me, uh, an industrial hygienist. I was invited here to talk about chemical exposure in nail salon. So uh, that's it for my talk. And uh, thank you very much for listening. And back to you, Mary. Thank you, Tuan. That was great. And we're really glad you made it back. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I think it was really interesting that uh, you have some data that shows that 70% of the nail salon owners are looking for some guidance. Um, that's very inspiring. So it's a great piece of information. Thank you. I, does anyone have um, any questions for Tuan before we move on? <laughs> We will all come back, our, our speakers, I hope, will all come back as a panel and we will be able to have some discussion. Um, but I, as I was saying, I, Albert um, Ten, Dr. Albert Ten is, is um, stuck in, in a cement plant without internet connection, but he has sent a couple of um, um, pieces of information that I think would be important to share. And hopefully the people that have worked with him, uh, like Ted, um, Dr. Zellers, maybe you could um, talk to that. So let me uh, bring up um, 
one of the first pieces of information. Um, I think this is uh, what I want to share. Uh, and let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Ken's background. He has, um, well, he has over 30 years of experience with the US, within the US and internationally dealing with sustainable development and business risk management. Uh, he is um, uh, currently a managing partner of the International Consultancy 2T Sustainability, a board member for the nonprofit Workplace Health Without Borders US and an advisory board member of OHTA. Albert was um, our, the second president of Workplace Health Without Borders uh, US branch. Um, and I, I think I misspoke because our current president is uh, Dr. David Goldsmith, um, and, and not me, um, but uh, I just wanted to clear that up. But anyway, Albert has studied um, environmental and occupational health issues ranging from the source and spread of Yersinia and related species as a causative agent of gastroenteritis, indoor air quality issues caused by adhesives, paints, and fungi, motor, uh, monitored the long-term effects of exposure to Portland cement dust on a cohort of 4,000 cement workers across Europe and Turkey, and identified and evaluated new technologies to treat um, hazardous and infectious waste. Uh, Dr. Ten has a bachelor's degree in biological chemistry from Tulane University, a master's in life sciences from New Mexico Highlands University, and his doctorate in environmental microbiology and biotechnology from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. His postdoctoral studies were with Oak Ridge Institute for Science and Engineering, and business studies at St. Galen University and the International Institute for Management uh, Development in Lausanne, Switzerland. So uh, Albert brings uh, an incredible amount of knowledge and expertise. And this is, um, uh, let's see, can you see the slide here or no? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, it's kind of, still in my email, but I, that doesn't matter. Um, so I don't know um, if uh, some of you that worked with Albert, I think uh, Dr. Rosenberg, uh, you are one of the people that worked with him. And I know Dr. Zeller, do you have, so maybe you could speak to this for us, would that work? I can make a few comments. Unfortunately, I have to leave almost immediately, but I'll make a few comments that uh, oh. Albert was uh, really one of the progenitors of the Michigan effort um, and, and of, of creating the Michigan Healthy Nail Salon co uh, Collaborative. So I wanna give him credit for that. And uh, he took on as part of his contribution uh, to try to generate uh, this sort of um, Healthy Nail Salon Certificate Program as an incentive for uh, salon owners to uh, have healthier salons. And um, I, I'm not sure that this wasn't a derivative of what the California uh, group had already been doing or not, but it was a, it was a great idea. And he pushed it actually in Cleveland because that's where he was living at the time. Um, and he piloted it there and uh, we had it on our agenda to do it in Michigan, too, if we were had gotten to that point, which we haven't yet. Um, and I don't have any data uh, or results uh, that um, Albert may have uh, generated uh, as part of that effort to get salons in the Cleveland area to, par to participate. Uh, but the idea is still a good one, and uh, I believe will be part of our future at Michigan. Thank you. Um, let me um, put up the second. Um, uh, is this now? Um, I'm sorry, maybe. Well, and incidentally, I think Marie Ann uh, did not overlap that much with, with Albert. Yeah. Um, um, okay. Yeah, I agree. 
<laughs> Another person who deserves uh, mention here is Stephanie Saylor, who did so much of the early work, uh, deserves so much of the credit uh, for the early work at Michigan. And, and she and Albert uh, worked together to a greater extent. Uh, yeah. So just to get that story straight. And I'm sorry, I do have to leave. So thanks so much well, uh, to, to everyone. Yeah. We're glad you came. <laughs> well, good to see you all. Uh, yes. There, there's my message. And uh, see you the next we'll one. see you again. Okay, oh. Tuan. Great to see you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye now. Bye. And so at this point, I, I think we would like to have a discussion with our wonderful panelists. And um, I don't know if... if um, if you would like to ask a question, I think that one of the best ways to do that is to turn on your um, mic and, and start sharing your video. Um, maybe to start off, I would like to ask the panel um, what, what they see as the best next steps to enable this concern about nail salons to grow and affect more places. I think I know we have someone uh, from Toronto who has been active in this. I know there are people in Florida and Minnesota that are concerned about this, but I don't think we're all connected. So from your experience, well, how, how, do you, how do you see us moving forward uh, with nail salons to make them healthier, both for the workers primarily, but customers as well? Well, I'll, I'll say something. Um, I, you know, coming at this from a researcher perspective, but from what I've seen with the California Healthy Nail Salon Collaborative, when I first um, started working um, with the California Healthy, members of the California Healthy Nail Salon Collaborative in 2010-11, I was just really impressed by the model of this um, organization that had three um, uh, interconnected arms, you know, policy advocacy, um, uh, worker owner outreach and research. And I was, um, it was a, a, to me at the time, it was a very unique uh, and, and model that um, seemed really effective at um, kind of uh, uh, leveraging um, the different facets of, um, supporting that community and the economic integrity of the nail salon community, but also working on multiple levels to try to ensure some sort of protection um, and, and empowerment in different ways. So it was like, a, I think what struck me, it was multi-pronged and it had effectiveness at different levels, um, at the worker level, at the policy level, and also just developing this research. And, um, and then the other thing I would and it's nice to see that that it seems like there's similar models out there, like in Michigan, um, it seemed very similar. It struck me as very similar. So, um, but other than that, I would say um, expanding those models to different, expanding those models to, to more and more places seems like a logical kind of way to expand the work, but also, um, um, uh, well, yeah, I, I also part of the green, the green nail salon certification program for my very humble perspective on, on the sidelines of that work seems like a great model to also engage um, uh, different, like both the um, customers and worker community um, for a similar or for a kind of a, a, a combined uh, positive goal to strive for and that uh, expansion of that and modeling of that across the country seems like a great thing to do as well. You know, promoting that sort of model seems like an, you know. Uh, uh, be before we uh, started that program, we also did a survey of uh, customer, owner, and worker. And a lot of customer say that they're willing to pay extra amount mm -hmm. uh, if the uh, premise uh, part of the Healthy Nail Salon program. So with that uh, recognition, it will like an assurance for the customer that these nail salon are clean or they do something accordingly to the law as well as focus on the employee and the customer healthy uh, or, or the uh, uh, 
basically the health of the customer. Yeah. So they're willing to pay extra for that. And so it's not only good for the nail salon worker, customer, but also for the business as well. Uh, it's a way for them to increase their income. Yeah. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the program are in uh, you know different city right now, and uh, we we able to work with the uh, different city and county to implement the program that integrate into their inspection or into uh, their guidance for businesses within their city. So one of the incentive was to have these businesses listed on their website. So when the people visit the city, they want their nail done, they might be able to see some of these uh, establishments listed in there, uh, in the website. So that will be a great bonus for the nail salon people to uh, participate. Uh, also, regarding the, the study that we conducted, it was one of the very expensive study because we use different kind of monitoring equipment, all the analysis. Uh, we try to collect really low level of chemical. So we use the EPA method TO15, uh, which use the summa canister, uh, all different instruments that we can utilize to measure. So each nail salon uh, air sampling cost and analysis amount up to like three, four thousand dollars each. Yeah. So, is that mostly Tuan for the ana chemical analysis of the sample? Uh, can you repeat the that, please? Co the laboratory costs for analysis. Yes, and uh, rental equipment and all that. Yes. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um. Mary, I wonder if I could ask a question. Oh, please, yes, yeah. that's wonderful. <laughs> um, well, congratulations to everybody. This, we're very, very inspiring uh, groups and, and efforts that you're doing. Uh, you, you sort of addressed this, Tuan, but I think you were talking largely about California. So I'm just wondering, um, some, some of you, I think Julia said that this is a model that could be uh, disseminated like across many different maybe states in the US and even across countries. So what do you know about to what extent there are other groups that are interested in picking up on this model? And is there any, um, are you making any efforts to, to reach out and, and sort of propagate this kind of model elsewhere? Yeah, actually uh, I met Ted in 2016 uh, and that's how the Michigan nail salon got started. Uh, we uh, provide him with information and support. And uh, we have a scientific group of uh, advisory members throughout the country. So hopefully in New York, or Florida, or other state, we'll be able to develop something similar to Michigan. And uh, we've been... Uh, in place for since 2005. So uh, fortunately, our budget is very healthy and each year uh, the budget keep increasing. So uh, we might be able to support, uh, provide the seed money for some of the uh, small group that want to start the program. And uh, that will be depend on uh, Lisa Fu, the CEO, of the, uh, uh, the executive director of the uh, collab and the group to make the decision. But most likely uh, our strategy is to have all different units throughout the country and link together so we can have uniform voice. Uh, for example, in California at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the governor uh, make a comment that uh, COVID-19 uh, first cases started in the nail salon and uh, that uh, misdirected statement uh, make really caught a damage to the group yeah and uh, they have no voice and suddenly they got picked on and to be an example 
uh, for the uh, COVID uh, pandemic spread. You know, so so that's what we try to do. We try to be able to put the uh, voice together to explain to people what exactly the kind of business these people are doing, and um, you know, make sure that it it meet all the uh, requirement and the law. That's great. Can I ask you where the funding mainly comes from? Uh, oh, uh, it's from everywhere. Uh, <laughs> EPA. OSHA, oh, uh, different group. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, our, 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 our budget last year were over half a million dollars. Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, if Great. I could just add to that here. Um, so yeah, we are so grateful for CHNSC support. I'm a native California myself as a transplant now in the Midwest in Michigan. So I will say that um, you know, California is definitely the prime example of, of what this kind of program should look like. But, um, you know, I think it is adaptable in different scenarios, but acknowledging that the circumstances might be different and challenging because we don't have quite the, the Vietnamese population as they do in California in terms of getting the community engaged and having, you know, community health workers, translators, and various professionals integrated in the community. Um, so it is it is much smaller here in Michigan. And I've heard, you know, of success stories out in Philadelphia, New York, and, and other more populous states where it's more likely to be diverse. Um, but I think that, you know, for us here at MHNSC and other, um, you know, regions where there might not necessarily be as much awareness, as much diversity, and as much of a, um, population to help uplift the collaborative it will it will definitely take time but I think that once we key on to the right people and the right stakeholders if the enthusiasm is there we can get the momentum going I don't know Marianne if you had anything to add to that no I think I think you you addressed it <laughs> great thanks um, Twan I do have a question for Twan is there um that statement that misguided statement is that Publish is that in the news somewhere that somebody could look up? Oh, oh yes, uh, that from uh, Governor Newsom. He he make that quote uh, without the data to back it up, and uh, it was on the news. Yeah, I, I can find that and send it to you. Yeah. <laughs> Mary, I don't know if you can see the hands raised. Um, oh, Anne Roshan yeah. Ford has a has her hand raised. Um. Oh, oh yes, Anne. Um, I was going to ask you anyway if you would share because are you doing the same kind of thing in Toronto and and what's the same and what's different and maybe you can tell us about it. Yeah, um, well, certainly the model in California has has extended not only beyond state borders, but beyond country borders and um, California was really the the impetus, um, the the route that they've taken was very much an influence on. Um, the focus that we've had. We've been going since about 2013 and um, our, our model has worked through a community health focus through a community health center in downtown Toronto um, with the involvement of a number of other uh, community and social service and health agencies. We've also had really strong connections with um, the University of Toronto and have been involved in peer reviewed research um, that they have done there. Um, initially, our focus has been or was largely on uh, work directly in the salons uh, relating to health issues from chemical exposures. That was a, a very strong focus, but um, it has, um, I guess, evolved over the year to include much more um, networking um, and the development of a nail technicians network amongst nail technicians. Um, we've been fortunate in that we've been able to um, uh, work with three different communities. Um, we have the same issue here, Aurora, that it, it's not predominantly uh, one language group. It's certainly more Vietnamese than others, but Chinese and Korean are also quite strong. So we've had outreach workers who speak those languages who go into the salons and do a lot of the, um, the outreach work there. But COVID really turned everything, as I'm sure most of you have experienced, turned everything on its head. Um, there's been a, 
pretty much a 180 degree turn in the, the nature of the work that we're, the outreach work that we're doing with nail technicians and nail salon owners because they were so hard hit here um, uh, by lockdowns and um, uh, you know various injunctions that made it impossible for them to stay open. And uh, so many of them uh, are just in survival mode. Uh, many salons have closed. We're waiting to see what things are gonna look like as our numbers um, lessen, you know, our numbers of uh, uh, people um, exposed and, and the vaccination rate increases. But right now, um, they are very much in survival mode. Um, and a lot of the work we've been doing with them through webinars and uh, phone work um, has been focused around helping them get assistance, uh, struggling with anti-Asian racism. We've been doing, um, uh, we're working on resources with a couple of good um, uh, anti-Asian racism uh, organizations to develop resources specific to nail technicians and nail salon owners. So right now we're really just trying to help them cope um, until they can reopen. And we're also developing resources uh, to help them reopen effectively and safely. Um, and that partially involves um, being careful with the kind of disinfecting that they're doing because they're already um, at high risk for um, health problems as a result of their own exposures and their, their occupation. Um, so trying to um, uh, help with, you know, looking at uh, alternatives to things like bleach and quads and things like that to, to be using safer products. Um, so there's a, there's a big road ahead in terms of um, what opening up is gonna look like for them. Um, and we're working as closely as we can with them through our nail technicians network um, and also working directly with nail salon owners to help them uh, in reopening when they can. Excellent. Yeah. I think Nellie Brown, did, did you want to ask a question or make a comment? Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, I did make a comment in the chat. Um, one of the things that I've done, uh, well, I've written on cosmetology, have a manual out since the late 80s. So I've been doing training on cosmetology for over 30 years. And uh, I do a lot of work, not with just salons or professional associations, but also with BOCES and vocational ed. And among the things that uh, I wanted to just note is New York State was actually the first state in the country to pass a ventilation regulation for nail salons. And it came about because of some very wonderful investigative journalism that was done by the New York Times. And what there were were three issues that came together. It wasn't just the chemical exposure for the nail salon technicians, but also serious issues of wage theft uh, and serious issues for immigrants and refugees where they were basically being threatened uh, with deportation if they, uh, or being blown into ICE or whatever, if they complained about their job or their wage theft. Uh, and so um, these things sort of all came together and led to uh, some serious work uh, on, on all of those issues. Of course, in New York State, we tend to find that the nail salon workers in the eastern part of the state uh, are more heavily uh, Chinese, Korean, uh, and uh, Hispanic. Whereas in West New York, where I've been doing training, they're heavily Vietnamese. And so um, I've been doing a lot of this work, as have others across New York State, by um, uh, working through the various worker centers uh, and COSH groups, the Coalitions for Occupational Safety and Health. And so the funding has come from a variety of, of sources, but some from the state. And um, that has enabled us to do some of these trainings. Um, and I've done PowerPoints and live training. <coughs> As I, I mentioned in the chat, to me, this issue of online training is very powerful uh, because we found even when going door to door to do outreach on workshops for Vietnamese nail technicians, um, the reality is they're too afraid of the owners and supervisors to show up. Uh, and when you try to do live stuff, you can get the owners there. Uh, but even in one workshop where I had owners and technicians, the technicians wouldn't talk. Even in you know, interactive exercise, they wouldn't talk. Um, so I think there's still a lot of, a lot of fear. 
uh, here. Um, and the online training, I think, is the way to get around this. You can build people's awareness, build their activism um, that uh, you can't necessarily get, you know, with the live training. And that's not the first time I've seen this. I've seen with Hispanic farm workers and other groups uh, that I've worked with, same kind of problem. But, but uh, people just very afraid. And if they uh, complain, you know, that they may face, you know, serious repercussions. Uh, those are really helpful insights. Thank you. Thank you both. Both. I mean, it's really interesting to hear. Um, did, did anyone else want to add anything? I think w one of the hardest things is to actually get started, but I think you all have talked about several different ways of doing that. And um, that's, that's very helpful too. Um, would, and is, are there any questions or maybe as a- uh, Yeah, well, I, uh, just a quick one. Uh, are we gonna post, um, post the other presentation? Yes, I'm not exactly sure where it will be, but it will be um, available okay. for people to. Yeah, uh, yeah, I got, I got the other three from the um, Dropbox, the Dropbox one. Oh, the, but that, those are really the only presentations we have. Okay. Three presentations, yes. I yeah, don't, I don't know for the yeah the one we didn't get didn't get here, but uh, we saw the summary. If uh, you know. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, I could I could put the, those up there as well. Yeah. So um, if, are there any last parting thoughts that the panel would like to leave with us? Oh, I was just gonna say, can you hear me? Um, I was gonna say to Nellie's point um, about the um, sort of uh, the workplace, the ability to even um, engage um, um, for workers in, um, in the um, environment in which they, they're, they're sort of vulnerable in other ways. Um, I, I think that um, focusing on solutions that uplift the ec economy of the of the workforce or, or things like what Tuan mentioned about um, uh, solutions that like increasing the prices that customers would pay for because they care about the exposures themselves would also maybe help engage owners and um, uh, and help workers get out of that box that they're in when they can't um, speak for themselves or speak out for themselves or, or uh, speak up for themselves. Um, so I would just I would just reiterate that I think that's a really good point, and that's why solutions that really lift up the eco ec economic integrity of um, that the occupational group are important and um, positive. Yeah. Uh, anything as far as a you know. Uh... No, sort of developing some other areas and stuff, um, sort of expansion to other cities, other, you know, other areas. That's up to you. <laughs> uh, so I see, yeah, there's something already uh, going on in different areas or get, uh, get packets, things ready to go, you know, or it could be set up by local, let's say local AIHA sections that could, you know, use this as a project or local universities. Uh, I just want to, sorry. Well, uh, last year, uh, one of the industrial hygienists uh, that had a root in South America have asked me to uh, provide some information regarding California Health in Nail Salon. So uh, at CPEC, uh, the California Institute for uh, Cancer Prevention, we did a study under Dr. Tu Quat uh, lead uh, we did a um, multi-year NIH-funded study. And as a result of that, we have some products, training products. And that product is the flip chart that has that you to train the worker uh, and the owner. So if we sit in front of a worker, we use the flip chart to, to flip. Uh, they will see the front. We have the text in the back that we can read off. And so I sent that module or that flip chart to uh, South America and they, they were able to translate into uh, 
Spanish. Yeah. So hopefully one day, since the American Industrial Hygiene Association plan to expand in uh, South America and to engage more people in that area to uh, become more aware of occupational hazard, uh, nerve salon will be one of them. Yeah, so we can maybe help somebody back there or down there to start a uh, nerve salon collaborative. Yeah. Yeah. And and I, I would love to connect you with the uh, uh, C, the uh, executive executive director of the California Healthy Nerve Salon. So uh, maybe you can uh, develop some uh, uh, collaboration or something. Yeah. Are you, are you talking to me, Tuan? Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. actually, we've we've made good connections with them. They've been a big inspiration to us. And we met with them in California a few Perfect. years ago. And we also invited them up here and did a big evening panel event with Tuquach and uh, and some of her collaborators. Okay. So they've been a, they've been a great, great support to us. I just want to add um, one other thing about this question of uh, that Eugene asked about you know, spreading the model to other places. One of the things that we learned here was that um, it's, it's really important to, uh, you know, there's one thing when people approach you and say, oh, can you tell us, you know, how you did what you did? And we want to do the same thing here in our city, which, which we have had from, from one other city in Canada. But we also just assumed that the situation was um, similar in other cities and and realized after we developed a whole training module to help other cities that um, in fact some cities are not going they just don't have the same demographics um, and they and some just don't have a very strong nail salon sector um, and we just assumed that they would because we have such a huge one here in Toronto um, so just sort of a caution that um, if you're doing any kind of outreach that it's important to connect in particular with the uh, communities that are most commonly known to be setting up the nail salon sectors, Vietnamese in, in many cases, um, that you connect with them at a real grassroots level mm -hmm. to find out what the story is in, in, in their city or town um, before assuming that you know, what you develop might be useful to them because we learned the hard way. <laughs> Great points. Well, I think, thank you all for, for staying for the entire length of this. And thank you so much to our presenters. Um, it, was, it was just wonderful. And for all the questions that, that you asked, and it was great to uh, get to know what you're doing in Toronto, Anne. Um, thank so you. This is good. I think we need to all stay in touch. <sighs>